I want to encourage you all to follow along with me as we read today's passage. Okay, it's it's found in the Old Testament book of Hosea. We'll read chapter 11, verses 7 through 9. Let's read. My people are bent on turning away from me. And though they call out to the Most High, he shall not raise them up at all. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zebulun? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. You know, we can be some double-minded people. We are quick to change our minds. Our emotions can shift almost immediately 180 degrees. For example, you might be in church and you enjoyed the worship. Your hands were raised. You were worshiping with all your heart. And then you heard the Bible exposited. And maybe it was a verse you heard a million times before. But this time, you were able to see it in a new life-giving light. After service, there was great conversation. You got yourself a cup of coffee. And this week, for some reason, uh, it just takes an extra good warming up your heart. And you step out of church full of joy and your cup is filled. Until... You walk three blocks, and maybe you're headed to the train station, or you're walking toward home, and all of a sudden, you step in a huge, stinky, sticky, fresh mountain of turd. I mean, it looks like a dinosaur pooped it. And what happens to that cheerful, blessed, joyous attitude of yours at that moment? I mean, almost instantly, your attitude changes in a heartbeat. I mean, it's like someone just flicks a switch, and something like that can just ruin your day. Now you went from praising God to praying that he smites every dog and every nasty person that doesn't pick up after the dog in a five-mile radius, right? You had this amazing experience, but now you're thinking about how you're going to have to clean this thing up and how stinky it is, and you're gagging just thinking about it. Maybe I'm exaggerating, but only a little bit, right? We can be such fickle people. The other day I was walking to church and we had some meetings at the church this week and we were walking from the supermarket to the hub and I was just so frustrated. I mean like almost all of a sudden at how many people were on the sidewalk. I mean we were pulling a cart with all the stuff that we needed for the meeting and I mean all these people were in my sidewalk in my way, right? I I got frustrated because it's the middle of the day. Shouldn't these people be at work or in school? I mean where am I? This, This isn't Times Square, right? I shouldn't have to fight off all these people. I just want to pull this stupid cart and get to the church, right? Get out of my way. Anyway, the point is that we can be so double-minded sometimes. Our emotions can be so fickle. We can go from uh, totally fine to a mental breakdown in a second. And if you consider yourself to be more strong-willed than that, you too have a breaking point. Eventually, whatever or whoever has gotten you upset will feel your wrath. Ain't that right? We've been in a series called Gentle and Lowly where we've been examining the heart of Christ towards us. At the most profound depths of Jesus' heart, you find someone who is gentle and lowly. You find someone who is so loving towards us that He doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. You can make the argument that to understand the heart of God, you examine the heart of Jesus. But many times we tend to think that the God that we see through Jesus in the New Testament is way different than the God that we see in the Old Testament. I mean, after all, God kicks Adam and Eve out of the garden after one screw-up. He floods the whole earth and only preserves Noah and his family. He destroys two whole cities with fire and sulfur. He threatens the nation of Nineveh through the prophet Jonah. Isn't that a different God? Isn't there a difference between the God of the Old and New Testaments? I don't think so. I believe that if you do careful study of God's Word, you'll find over and over again that God is consistent in His kind, compassionate, merciful, and patient heart. God isn't like us where he a switch suddenly flips and He reacts or overreacts. Because we are that way, we tend to give God the same label. But the truth is that God is consistent. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is just and fair. There is no overreaction with God. And so to help us see this today to help us get a better understanding of God's heart and to show you that it is consistent with the heart of Christ, I want us to study a passage from the Old Testament. And I have three uh, big ideas, starting with number one. It's this. You can write this down. We don't tend to fully understand God's holiness. Part of the reason we're unable to fully understand both God's love towards us and His hatred towards sin is because we simply do not understand His holiness. 
On the flip side, we don't understand how truly wicked and reviling our sin is before a holy and righteous God. God speaking through the prophet Hosea, he says in verse 7 in today's passage that we read a moment ago, he says this, My people are bent on turning away from me, and though they call out to the Most High, he shall not raise them up at all. God says that his people, we're talking about the people that he set apart, the people that he loves, that he's demonstrated himself most powerfully to, they're bent on turning away. In other words, their predisposition is to turn away or run away from God. And it doesn't take a very deep look into the Old Testament to see that this is true. From the book of Genesis onward, it's a narrative of people who God created and who he loves dearly, but they don't reciprocate the affection towards him. They constantly run away. They constantly turn towards false gods and idols. They constantly choose a path of sin over one of righteousness. Now, perhaps you're unable to truly understand the holiness of God because you're unable to understand how truly wicked your sin is. This is why Paul writes in Romans that we have all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Sin is pervasive in each and every single one of us, as pervasive as the holiness is in God. Uh, 1 Samuel 2.2 confirms this for us. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. And there is no rock like our God. There is no one holy like the Lord. It's that holiness that moves God to hate sin and to have to deal with it justly. That's why there's a hell. Hell is a place where God will justly deal with those who have rebelled against Him and have refused His kind, compassionate, and merciful heart. Whenever we see God deal with the sin and rebellion of people, it is absolutely fair and just. But perhaps we place this unfair caricature on God because we simply do not grasp the full weight of our sin against a holy and righteous God. Dane Ortland, in his book Gentle and Lowly, helps flesh this idea further, and he gives us a reason as to why we can fall into this trap. He writes this, We don't feel the weight of our sin because of our sin. If we saw with deeper clarity just how insidious and pervasive and revolting sin is, we would know that human evil calls for an intensity of judgment of divine proportion. In other words, our sin is what keeps us from seeing how truly wicked our sin is. We want to sit in the place of judge and tell God how he should pass around judgment. And that is incredibly sinful in and of itself. So like Israel, We too are bent on turning away. Our predisposition is to run away, not run towards. Our sin is not just against a person or one another or against creation, but against the God of the universe. I need you to get a glimpse into the holiness and the majesty and the glory of God. And when you do, you will notice how truly sinful you are and how much in need you are of His mercy. Which leads me to our next big idea, number two. You can write this down. And that is that we don't tend to fully understand God's heart. Even though we are sinful, and even though we are fully deserving of God's wrath and judgment, what we find instead is that God's heart is toward us. While we're bent towards running away, God's heart is bent towards running towards us. And this is what he writes in Hosea 11, 8. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adama? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. What a powerful word picture is painted here by God as communicated through the prophet. He describes his heart as recoiling within him. Uh, The word translated recoils is the Hebrew word hafak. And it's a difficult word to translate in this context. It means to turn, to overthrow, to overturn, or to change. It's a challenge to describe because the idea that's being drawn out here is almost like there's a war in God's heart. The war is with with his standard of holiness and righteousness against his overwhelming love and compassion for his people. And I almost hate describing it this way, but it's such a hard statement to understand. You see, God's holiness makes that he absolutely has disdain and hatred towards that which is unholy and sinful. Yet it is matched by his immense and immeasurable affections towards his people. Ortland quotes, Uh, Thomas Goodwin in his book, and I'll just share a summary of what he says versus reading a direct quote. Uh, Goodwin says that it's like a father who has a son who is suffering with some sort of horrific disease. Think of something like cancer, right, that compromises the child's immune system, causes his hair to fall out and to be bedridden. The father in this situation doesn't hate the son. He hates the cancer. 
He hates the disease that is eating at his child. And in a sense, the disease draws him closer to his son, to care for him, to protect him, to love him in an even deeper sense. In a similar fashion, we struggle to fully grasp the heart of God towards those of us in Christ Jesus. He says to us, as he did to Israel, how can I give you up? How can I abandon you? How can I leave you to your ugly sin and stupidity? Ortland writes this, If you are a part of Christ's own body, your sin evokes his deepest heart, his compassion and pity. He sides with you against your sin, not against you because of your sin. He hates sin, but he loves you. Do you have this understanding of God's heart towards you? That his affections are towards you. And as such, he refuses to let you go. He refuses to abandon you. In fact, he can't. His heart towards you is simply too tender. Now, this doesn't mean that he doesn't discipline us. In fact, the Bible says the opposite. It says that he disciplines those that he loves. Just like we do with our children. It's an unloving thing to let your children go undisciplined. Because then you'll just, you'll just create entitled, spoiled, and wild children that think they can do whatever they want. And it's the same with God as our Heavenly Father. But at the core of who He is, at the core of His heart, is a kind and compassionate Father whose affections are towards you. Which leads us to our last thought for today. Number three, and you can write this down. We don't tend to fully understand God's love. Part of the difficulty with fully understanding God's love is that we have different standards and different definitions of love. Our versions of love are often connected to fickle emotions or based on what we can receive from someone. In short, our love is extremely conditional and shallow. But God's love is so different. He has unconditional love. It's not a love that falls short of our performance. It's not a love that is dependent on how advanced our knowledge of the Bible is. It's not dependent on us at all. And this is the message that God communicates through the prophet Hosea, to his people. This is his heart communicated towards us. Look at what he says. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in my wrath. God says that his compassion grows warm and tender. Wait a second, God, your compassion is growing warm and tender for a people that are bent and turning away from you? A people who rebel against you time and time again? God says that he will not execute his burning anger. It's almost like there's this pent-up rage, not against the people, but against the sin that ravages them. Yet God withholds his anger. Is this the picture of God that you have in your mind? And then he gives us the reason why. He says, for I am God, not a man. In other words, you guys are so quick to be angered and give in to that anger. You are quick to speak from both sides of your mouth. You are quick to showcase your rage. You are fine uh, one second in church and then you're cursing your spouse or your neighbor out the moment you step uh, out of of the building. But that ain't me. I'm not like that. I am God. And then he says that he is the Holy One in your midst. What is it that withholds his wrath? What is it that withholds his righteous anger? It's his compassionate heart towards his children. God's heart is incredibly warm and tender towards you. Did you know that? Some of you need to hear this today. Some of you need this reminder. God loves you so tremendously. He loves you with a love that is nothing like the love you've experienced this side of eternity. It's an indescribable, unimaginable, reckless love. Why wouldn't you want to surrender to a God like that? When you pull away, when you run away, when you smack him in the face, when you blatantly disobey, his compassion grows and grows and grows more and more tender and more warm towards you. And it is most evidently demonstrated in the lengths by which he would go to bring you to him. God loved you so much that he sent Jesus. Jesus is God in human flesh. In other words, God entered his own creation in order to redeem his creation. Jesus came in to resolve the sin conflict which God so blatantly hates. Unlike us, Jesus perfectly upheld the law of God. He lived a perfect and sinless life. He was led to a cross where he was hung, mocked, spit on, ridiculed, whipped, and tortured. Then in the last few moments before Jesus would commit his spirit to the Father, all of God's wrath towards your sin and mine, all of his pent-up righteous anger was placed onto the shoulders of Jesus. Jesus took the wrath of God for you. So you wouldn't have to. And then he died. And they placed Jesus in a tomb, as was prophesied several hundred years before his death. 
until three days later when Jesus conquered Satan's sin and death and he rose victoriously from the grave. God's wrath was satisfied. God's love was demonstrated. And now for all who look to that cross and put their faith in Jesus, we will experience forgiveness of sin and new life. Instead of getting what our sin deserves, we're met with a kind and compassionate Father who loves us more than we can imagine, whose heart grows tender and warm to us, who does not come in wrath, but comes in love and welcomes us into his family through Jesus. And if you want to experience God's love and his saving grace, I invite you to put your faith in Jesus. Swerve, here's your reminder today. God loves you so tremendously, more than you can imagine. Let's pray. God, you are holy. You are righteous. You are pure. So we worship you. We surrender to you. For those of us that are unable to see your holiness, open our eyes, God. For those of us unable to see the true wickedness of our sin, reveal it to us and break our heart to acknowledge our need for you. Thank you, Father, for a kind and compassionate heart that grows tender and warm even to wayward children like us, that you draw near to us and that you return our folly with your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, for a love that is indescribable, unimaginable, and so great that we can barely grasp it. Help us to love like Jesus, to show the same compassion to those around us. And make us bold to declare our, to our community that God loves them, that God desires and longs to be with them and to be in relationship with them. Open the eyes of our neighbors, of our family, of our friends, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.